Good morning and welcome to Morning Prayer from St Peter's Church, Ipsley. My name is Chris McLaren and I'm part of the worship team here at St Peter's. And my husband Peter will be sharing God's word with us in a little while. But let's start with a prayer. Let us pray. The night has passed and the day lies open before us. Let us pray with one heart and mind. Lord of all, in reverence and humility, awe and wonder, we come to worship you. Meet, meet with us now and be with us always. Amen. And our first reading is from Psalm 103. And I'm reading the first six verses and then verses 20 to 22. So Psalm 103, beginning at verse 1. Praise the Lord, O my soul, all my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works for righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. Praise the Lord, you his angels, you mighty ones who do his bidding, who obey his word. Praise the Lord, all his heavenly hosts, you his servants who do his will. Praise the Lord, all his works, everywhere in his dominion. Praise the Lord, O my soul. Amen. And we now have a special visitor coming to be with us for part of this morning. Good morning to all of you who are logged on to morning prayer this Monday. My name is Hermas, and I've been asked to give you an introduction to the reading that is the basis of today's thoughts. For reasons best known to themselves, those who decided on the readings missed this introductory part out. So here goes. I'm a beggar who lives in Jerusalem. You know, we've had a lot of turbulence in these last few years with a lot of stirring things happening about a man called Jesus of Nazareth. Some people thought he was the long-awaited Messiah. But if he was, I would have expected him to have healed me from one of those occasions he was in Jerusalem because that's what the Messiah was meant to do. I did know another lame man whose spot was near the Sheep Gate, who he, he was healed by this Jesus of Nazareth. But these good things don't seem to happen to me. Oh, by the way, if you know of someone who's been healed by the power of Jesus of Nazareth, and you have not, keep believing because God may have some other plan for you as he had for me. But I, was, I must press on. I was on the afternoon beggar shift this day. You see, there are so many of us that needed help that there had to be a sort of begging shift system. My friends carried me up to my begging place and various other people were going up into the temple because it was the ninth hour. For you, that would be mid-afternoon. I just got comfortable on my mat when I saw a couple of youngish men just about to pass by. Now, 
I'd heard a lot of the psalms sung at various times by the temple choir so that I knew only the Lord could heal my very painful bones, as it says in Psalm 6. So I called out, Brother, can you spare a shekel for the love of God? Well, they stopped. And the older one said, Look at us. Well, that was very encouraging. So I looked and held out my right hand, but he said, Sorry, I don't have any drachmas or gold coins, but I will give you something I've got. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Instead of giving me something in my right hand, he grabbed my right hand and pulled me up, and I didn't fall over. I got this funny feeling in my ankles, and my bones were no longer in agony. I found I could stand. I found I could walk. I found I could jump. What is more, I remembered that another psalm, Psalm 103, where it says to praise the Lord for he heals all your diseases. So there I was with these two young men, at least ten years my junior, leaping around like a child and singing all sorts of different psalms, different ones to the ones they were being sung at the normal service. It caused quite a stir, let me tell you, because most of those in the temple had known me as the beggar at the gate. But before I leave you, I have just two points for you to think about. One, those coming to worship felt it was their duty before God to help the needy. That was why they gave to us beggars. Now, just a few hundred stadia north of where I am, there's the city of Beirut, where I hear there's been a large disaster in your days. What have you done to show your godly duty to those in need in your day. And there's something else very funny I found out. I know that healing from a bone disease that leaves you in agony is only by the Lord. It says that in Psalm 6, verse 2. But Peter and John said the healing was in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. What does that tell you about who Jesus Christ is? Two things for you to think about this morning. Thank you, Hermas, for those thoughts. We come now to our second reading. And this is from Acts chapter 3, beginning at verse 11 and reading to the end. While the beggar held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished and came running to them in the place called Solomon's Colonnade. When Peter saw this, he said to them, Men of Israel, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we had made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed and you disowned him before Pilate though he had decided to let him go. You disowned the Holy and Righteous One and asked that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this. By faith, in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see 
and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has given this complete healing to him, as you can all see. Now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders. But this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through the prophets, saying that his Christ would suffer. Repent, therefore, and turn to God, so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord, and that he may send the Christ, who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. He must remain in heaven until the time comes for God to restore everything, as he promised long ago through his holy prophets. For Moses said, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You must listen to everything he tells you. Anyone who does not listen to him will be completely cut off from among his people. Indeed, all the prophets from Samuel on, as many as have spoken, have foretold these days. And you were heirs of the prophets and of the covenant God made with your fathers. He said to Abraham, Through your offspring, all peoples on earth will be blessed. When God raised up his servant, he sent him first to you to bless you by turning each of you from your wicked ways. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Chris, for that reading. We remember the setting. A few weeks after Pentecost, and the gift of the Holy Spirit had come, it had turned a scared Peter into a bold Peter, who would speak of Jesus to anyone and everyone. Peter and John were going up to worship in the temple, and Peter healed a lame beggar. A great crowd gathered, seeing the commotion of the man who'd been lame. Forty years old he was, leaping around, pre praising God. And Peter's sermon to the crowd who had gathered forms the reading that we have had. And we're going to consider this morning only one small point of that marvellous reading. In verse 15, Peter is speaking to the crowd in the temple. And he tells them about Jesus and the resurrection and the events of his death, etc. He comments in verse 15, we are witnesses of this. Let us look at the word witness a little more. A witness, then, is someone who's in some official position and tells what they've seen or heard of an event. There are important points of being a witness that we can learn from this account and also from other passages in the New Testament. For the word is used, either in the singular or plural, as witnesses, over 30 times. It's a favourite word of Luke. It occurs 13 times in Acts alone. Now the important thing of being a witness is you must have been there. You cannot be a witness of events you have not seen. You cannot be a witness of a conversation you have not heard. Peter and John said they were witnesses. 
You see, when I say that I've seen the Victoria Falls in Zimbabwe and Zambia, I do not mean that I've seen a marvellous picture of them, even though it might have been a superb, high-quality print. I mean, I've been there. And it's not good enough for me to claim to be a witness of the Victoria Falls by asking my dad about it and looking at his pictures of him sitting a lot closer to the edge than I would ever dare to go. I have walked along the bank. I have got wet in the continuous spray. I've heard the roar. I've seen the keen types bungee jumping over the Victoria Falls Bridge and others go down the rapids in canoes and rafts. I am a true witness. And as a witness, I can compare this waterfall to the Niagara Falls in Canada. One has railings to keep you safe. One has an unguarded edge. One has hot, steamy spray. One has blowing ice crystals. I've seen it. I can be a witness. And what does Peter say? He says, By faith, in the name of Jesus, this man who you see and know was made strong. Being a witness to the events of the life, death and resurrection of Jesus had a corollary. Others had to be told so that there was repentance and faith and healing. And this has always been the way in the Christian church. Remember Jesus said to Thomas in John twenty twenty nine, Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Remember again those words from Peter's sermon we've just heard. The God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob has glorified his servant Jesus. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses to this. Notice again that Peter turned the attention from himself as the witness onto Jesus who was the source of the miracle and the death and resurrection. And he told the crowd that it was not just the name of Jesus that brought healing, but there was something further the crowd had to act, they had to repent and turn to God. Verse 19. So the disciples were witnesses of two things. One, that Jesus had lived for three years and as a teacher, and his teachings, miracles and actions, were of God and were prophesied in the Old Testament. They could say to those around them, yes, we were there. We can testify that this is so. We are witnesses. They were also a witness that the people had crucified Jesus, a blameless man, the founding leader of life. The one who founded life itself and who continues it. But God raised him from the dead. And the disciples did not just say this once or twice. Peter said it in all his three recorded sermons in Acts. In Acts 2, in Acts 3 and Acts 5. And because a time came when the number who could say from first-hand experience, we are witnesses, that they had met Jesus, that number was going down through death. Various disciples then 
put down in writing their accounts of these events. And today we have this in the four Gospels. Like my two waterfalls that I'm a witness to, the disciples were witnesses to these two great events, the life, teaching and crucifixion of Jesus and also his mighty resurrection that first Easter Sunday by the power of God. And they used this fact that they were witnesses to urge repentance of faith on their hearers so that there would be repentance of sins. For us, we were not there at the events of the life of our Lord. So how can we be witnesses in our day? There are actually three ways and we need to use them all. One, we must know the facts about the life, death and resurrection of Jesus that is in the Gospels and be ready to explain the facts to those who ask us. For we live in a society where the basic facts are not known at all by many people. And the events of Jesus' life are described as fulfilling the words of prophecy in the Old Testament. So we should try and have an understanding of a wide range of the Bible, both Old Testament and New Testament. Many of us find a daily reading from the Bible helps us in this. Attending a house group or morning prayers at church can help as well. Secondly, we must be able to speak of our own experiences of God's power and grace to us in Jesus Christ. It is no good for me just speaking of the effect of God's grace on my parents or my brothers or even my children I must be able to speak about the grace and forgiveness of God on me and how those times of refreshing come from the Lord. And thirdly, we need the power of God's Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God who came upon the church at the day of Pentecost. For it was that Spirit who made the coward Peter, who denied his Lord, the bold Peter we read about in today's lesson from Acts. For this is what Jesus had said to his apostles, his disciples, and he says to us, You will receive power, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea and in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So may we be faithful witnesses in our day. Amen. Thank you, Peter. And we come now to our time of prayer. I'm using a slightly different format than from the one we often use. But as I pray, I will pause to enable each of us to pray our own prayer for that particular situation. And as we pray, we do remember all those in particular need, whether mentioned in the catch or known to us per personally. We remember too events around the world which has brought shock and dismay to many. So let us pray. Lord of all, we step aside from the busy routine of our lives. A few moments away from our daily activities and humdrum concerns. An opportunity to bring them quietly and prayerfully before you and to place them 
in your hand. Lord, we bring ourselves, our strengths and weaknesses, our faith and doubts, our hopes and fears. Lord, we bring our families, our friends and neighbours, those we love, those we know, and those we simply pass in the street or meet in the supermarket. Lord, we bring our community, the estate where we live, the town of Redditch, our country and the world, places far and near, some that we know and others so removed from our experience. We pray too, Lord, for all those who serve in these areas for the common good. Lord, we bring our church and the churches where we have worshipped in the past and commend to you all those involved in serving you in them, the ministers both ordained and lay, the councils who have oversight, all the members who worship in them. Lord, in quiet confidence, we entrust all to your care, knowing that your love is more powerful and your power more loving than we can ever know or imagine. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us share now together in the prayer that Jesus taught us, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And a blessing. May the goodness and loving kindness of our God follow us all the days of our lives. May his loving kindness and truth continually preserve us so that we can say, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Amen. And thank you for being with us this morning. We look forward to seeing you for the rest of the week.